Hey guys, this is Clarissa Pena for CGS TV. We're here with Steve Emerson, the VFX supervisor at Leica. Steve, can we start off with how you ended up working at Leica? I started at Leica, uh, it was the end of 2007. Uh, I'd been working down here in Los Angeles for the better part of like you know, almost 20 years, just uh, a lot of boutique visual effects houses, post houses, uh, worked for a long time with IMAX. And uh, my family and I, we were just looking for a change and uh, we loved Portland, Oregon. And it was pretty amazing. It just all sort of timed out where they, they started production on Coraline. Uh, they were looking for somebody to come in and, and solve a problem with that production, which they just had this big breakthrough with 3D printing and how they were gonna be handling the puppets on that film. And so what they were gonna be doing is they were printing up faces on a 3D printer uh, and then they would print up the, the brows independent of the mouths, okay? And these things, they get snapped onto the puppet's faces at every frame. And it enables us to get a greater range of expression. So like if you think back to like a stop motion film like uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas, okay? Yeah. Jack Skellington, which was done with replacement animation as well, they take his whole head off, it was all hand carved. He was capable of about roughly 800 different expressions. Because of the way that they're approaching facial animation on Coraline with the two pieces to the face, right. they were going to be capable of over 200,000, right? And now they've got it to somewhere, it's like over a million at this point, right? But it was a really, really big breakthrough for the studio. But the problem was, was that they had this, this line that was running right down the center of all the characters' faces, okay? And that needed to be taken care of. Right. And actually, at that point in the studio, there was, it, it, there was a lot of very sort of old school, hardcore, stop motion guys, and they were fighting, they just wanted to leave it, all right? But ultimately, it was decided it was gonna to be too distracting, um, so they needed somebody to come in and assemble a group and just get to work for the better part of a year, just painting lines out on every single puppet in that film. And uh, fortunately, I, I had the background, and they liked me, and they gave me a shot, and uh, we went to work, and you know, eventually we got ahead of schedule, and then we were able to take on a lot of the other visual effects film on the, uh, or the visual effects work on the film as well. Uh, so yeah, and I've been there ever since. I haven't left eight years now. Wow. Could you briefly tell us the history of visual effects at Leica? Well, okay, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary, which was a big deal. Um, so I started eight years ago, and again, I showed up during Coraline, and it was definitely it was a much different place there at that point. Henry Selleck, who was directing that film, uh, he wanted to get as much in camera as possible. He didn't want to use a lot of CG in that film. Um, there are some CG components in there, but for the most part, Henry was really, it was about, we're, we're, we're going to get this in camera. So a great deal of the work that we were doing was compositing and cosmetic work, um, the paint work, like with the seam removal we were doing. Um, and we were doing a lot of that in shake back then, and then also using a silhouette for the painting. But when we moved into Paranorman, which was just over a year after then, I mean, the studio at that point, they were really starting to find their way in terms of the type of films they wanted to make. Right. And then that's when they started talking about making hybrid films. You okay. know? The thing about stop motion is it's so hard to make those movies because it's everything needs to be built. Right. So if you got a kitchen table, you got to build everything from the silverware to the salt and pepper shakers to the puppets to the tablecloth. Everything's got to be built. And what that means is that you, as a filmmaker coming into stop motion, you're immediately asked to start making concessions because it's so hard. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that let's, let's just let's stop making those concessions and then let's start looking at technology to be able to, to tell the stories that we want to tell. And then beyond that, take stop motion in those worlds like places that it's never been before. Okay? So we were going to be given the opportunity in visual effects to start integrating more CG components into those films. And so, Paranorman, we had our first uh, CG extras, which were background crowds in that film. We were very careful at that point to always make sure there was a layer or two of practical hand-animated puppets in front of all the CG. Um, and then we also did a lot of the uh, cloud work. There is a witch face cloud that emotes in that film. Um, that ended up being all CG. 
And then we also we figured out what the process was, that in order to make sure that these computer-generated components were going to live in those worlds and look good, we always make sure, like in the case of the cloud, um, there's a physical example that's created first by our rigging team and, and animated by our animators. And then we can use that, we get it out on the sets, we light it, we animate it, the directors say they love it, and then we know we have a clear target for the CG. And we can recreate that and then implement it across the film. Okay? So Paranorman was the first film that really was, we were open to doing that type of work. And then for Box Trolls, the thing about that film is it was in terms of complexity and detail, uh, particularly with a lot of the, the CG extras in that film, um, there was just a real push to, to, to upgrade a lot of the technology that we had to make sure that, that we could handle the additional work that we were going to be asked to do. Okay. Because the work gets more complex, the scale of the film gets bigger, but you always kind of got about the same amount of money and you got the same amount of hands out on the floor that are doing these visual effects. So you really, really have to zero in and find those efficiencies. And uh, that was really, uh, I think Box Trolls was for us. It's like we were starting to really dial in the pipeline, the technology that we had, as opposed to Paranorman, which was a lot of out-of-the-box software at that point. Huh. Well, how has the production pipeline evolved in the past 10 years at Leica? Well, that, that was mostly it. I mean, we went Coraline. It was, I mean, honestly, we, we had a couple of guys uh, out on the floor that, that had built a lot of the tools that we're using to launch shots, to be able to track data, um, to know where your scripts were, have, have some level of organization. But beyond that, you know, in terms of like an overall pipeline, it really didn't exist at that point. Um, we had a good year, year and a half before Paranorman where the uh, technology groups at Leica, uh, we were all able to like kind of sit down and, and develop, you know, the beginnings of that. Um, and then, like I said, you know, uh, Paranorman was still, it was a lot of stuff right out of the box. I mean, we were using Shave for a lot of the hair work back then. Photoshop for texture painting, um, you know, but it was really, it was box trolls where we started adopting a lot more of the, the foundry technology and we started to, to really create a much, much more robust production pipeline. Okay, could you please run us through your day-to-day -day at Leica? Sure, my day-to-day, -day, I get in, I get in early because that, that's, that's the only time I have to kind of catch up and, and uh, not have to answer questions or run around and put out fires. Um, so I got about an hour that I'm catching up just on the stuff from the day before. Um, about 8.15, I go over for dailies with the camera department. And basically, you know, we, we work at a clip there. There's, there's roughly 50 active animation stages. Uh, the animators work with a quota of about four seconds a week if they're doing well. So each shot is progressing at you know, a little less than a second a day. But it's so slow. And, and uh, you know, it, it takes so much time. And beyond that, things just go wrong. You know, guys bump into things. You know, the, the art department builds a driveway out of gravel and it's, or, or kitty litter or something, and, it, and it's not properly glued down, and suddenly it's moving all over the place. A lamp will blow out. Um, because of heat or, or changes in temperature, the environments start to kind of shift. So we go in and we, we look at everything from the day before and we start to gauge whether or not there are problems. And there always are. And so, and then it's me out on the stages, typically with the camera guys, and we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we get this shot done? What needs to be fixed? Can we, do we have to drop a green screen here? Or can we just nudge this over? Or can we just sort of warp something in, in post-production if it needs it? We're just solving problems in the morning. Uh, after that, then I go back, there's a, the visual effects team is located directly across the street from the main warehouse where all the stages are. Um, and we have about 65 artists that are over there. Um, we have a, uh, a, a real D projection system that we use to do visual effects dailies. So then I will go over there and typically there's a meeting and then I go in the theater and we'll do dailies and we're just looking at shots. And at that point, you know, my job is to make sure that the visuals that are coming off of that floor are hopefully reflecting the vision that the director has, has you know, uh, communicated to me. Right. And uh, if things are looking good, we'll, we'll put it on into a playlist to show the director next time we get together. Um, if they need help, 
If there's problems, if, if things need to change, then we give those otters those notes, it's logged in our database, and they're back out onto the floor. And then it's a lot of meetings. A lot of meetings, a lot of problems, a lot of running across the street, working with the camera team. You know, again, it's, it's stop motion is, it's a, it's a very uh, precarious thing, you know, it's, it's, uh, and things are always going wrong. So there, there's plenty to keep me busy and my team. Right. As a VFX supervisor, do you find yourself working on other things besides visual effects? Um, let's see, I work on my relationship with my wife a lot because, <laughs> yeah, I'm constantly working. <laughs> Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's really not a lot of time to do anything else. I, I get into work usually like 6, 6.30 in the morning. I go home at 6.35 and I manage to get there in time to, to sit down, have dinner with my family, um, and spend a couple hours with the kids, and then I go to sleep. And on the weekends, my wife needs a break. So, yeah, <laughs> other than, than being a visual effects supervisor, like, uh, I'm really just a dad, yeah. Nice, nice break, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, from a production perspective, what were your favorite things to work on in Coraline, Paranorman, and the Box Trolls? Um, let's see. There was there was so much cool stuff in all of those films. Um, I mean, really, for for Coraline, uh, and really all of this stuff. I mean, the the best part of working there, it's not necessarily the 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 shot work itself. It's, it's really, it's about the, the people and the team and the relationships. And there, there's so many talented artists up there in Portland um, that we're all driven towards this common goal. And, it, and it's really, really hard to realize it. You know, it's like, I went to work at like eight years ago and we finished three films and we're halfway through another one. And then a lot of my friends that are still down here in Los Angeles or have gone up to Vancouver or out to London, they've worked on like 10 movies, you know? So it's, but, but the flip side of that is it's great in that when it's done, I'm so excited to share it with my friends and my family and my colleagues. Um, but yeah, and a lot of that is it's just, it's the people there and, and, and the artists there and what they're capable of executing. So it's like when I think about you know, Coraline and Paranorman and Box Trolls. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, there, there were some some breakthroughs and some some amazing visuals that I think we were able to, to pull off. But it really, it goes back to thinking about the directors that we were working with, yeah. the people that were on our team. And uh, yeah, that, that was all the best stuff. That's great. What were the most challenging things? The most challenging things. Um, well, definitely on the, on the box trolls. Um, again, the the complexity of those characters. Well, gosh, even paranormal. If if you go back and, and you watch Leica films, um, for instance, on Coraline, we were doing the the uh, work with the replacement animation and the facial seam cleanup. Right? And uh, the thing that was relatively simple about that show it was still hard, but. The, uh, the faces themselves, they were there, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of detail. You know? uh -huh. Coraline, I think she had like five or six freckles on her face mm -hmm. that were difficult to deal with. But uh, for the most part, they were pretty simple surfaces. The big leap in Paranorman uh, was that they started to, to look at putting a lot of detail on those characters' faces. So characters started blushing. Uh, the character Neil, you know, he had freckles all over his face. Characters had, you know, um, big like wrinkles on them. And we were very, very careful to make sure that we kept a lot of that, that fine, fine detail away from those seam lines. Uh, because of the way that we were doing it, it just, it made the work much, much more difficult. And again, we have limited resources. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, that was hard. And then what ended up happening is, you get so busy with that production. And then the next one's starting and you got a thousand other things going on. And typically I will, I will go over and I'll work with the uh, director of Rapid Prototype and, and I'll look at the puppets and I'll sort of consult on, you know, how it's being lined up, where, where the splits are, whether or not the detail's too close to the seam line and things like that. We were so busy on Paranorman, uh, a lot of those meetings never happened. And so suddenly we're being asked to to you know, take these seam lines off of these box trolls, and there's just there's detail that's going right up to it. Like it's right on the detail right on those seams, and so they snuck it in there. And then, uh, as you know, in visual effects, it's like 
okay, we got to figure it out. Yeah. You know, it's like you're up against something and you just, there's always a solution, you know. And so, yeah, we just dug in and we figured it out. And, and so now things just get increasingly, increasing, more and more complex. And then it goes for the, the costume work as well. Well, for VFX artists that want to break into the industry, what kind of advice would you give them? Oh, well, it's, it's amazing now, to, to be honest, the, the resources that are available for people out there to learn visual effects. Uh, when I was coming up, and it was the, the early, early 90s, um, you know, the systems that, that we were working on, um, I started uh, as I had the opportunity to get my hands on a flame. Uh, but those things, you know, there was, those setups were hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the only reason I really was given those opportunities was because I was the one guy at the facility that was willing to work from midnight to 6 a.m., you know. And, uh, but nowadays, it's the systems and the software is so inexpensive. You know, you can have it on a Mac in your backpack. Um, the amount of material out there, you know, in terms of tutorials is, is infinite. Um, you can really educate yourself. And, and I think that's a big part of it is, is making sure you, you, you know your stuff. Um, being aware of, you know, the way things were done previously. Understanding lenses and cameras. Um, all that stuff is, is very, very valuable. And then ultimately making sure that, you know, you can put together a solid reel, um, that you establish relationships uh, with recruiting departments and, and hopefully people at places like SIGGRAPH, um, that you can just, I did a presentation yesterday and people come up to me afterwards and we shake hands and we swap cards and they're so smart to do that, you know? It's because a lot of it also is just about generating opportunity through relationships. So again, it comes back to, um, you know, educate yourself, understand where we came from and, you know, some of the bigger basics with production. If you have artistic talents, obviously that's a, that's a big, big part of it, you know, if you've had the opportunity to go to art school. And then ultimately, you know, uh, develop those relationships, get in touch with those recruiters. They're out there and they're getting paid to talk to you. Um, and, and be persistent, but don't be annoying, yeah. you know? <laughs> that's great advice, Steve. Uh, thank you. What does the future hold for Leica? I can't talk about that, to be I honest. Can. No, I can, I can tell you a little bit. Um, we are currently working on our fourth feature, which is called Kubo and the Two Strings. Um, and uh, it's being directed, it's going to be the directorial debut of my boss, Travis Knight, which is really exciting. Uh, it's a Japanese adventure uh, fable set in uh, ancient Japan. Uh, it, it's, it is, I think, by far, not only the most challenging project we've had to deal with in terms of the, the visuals, but it's just flat out beautiful. And it's exciting and it's it's hilarious. And you, you sit down to watch it and, and you know hopefully people have a similar experience with, with the other Leica films, but it's a it's a great story. Hopefully it's it's taking you to another place. Um, but but it just it, it it is a piece of art. It's just it's just gorgeous. So again it, we got a whole we got another year to work on that thing and uh, I, I cannot wait to share it. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Steve, for your time, and I hope you enjoy Seagraph. I will. Have a great show. Thank you. This is Clarissa Pena signing off for CGS TV. I'll see you guys soon.